Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, our special guest is Cindy Cohen, Executive Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which defends civil liberties across the digital world. Cindy, thank you so much for, for being on again. It's been, a, it's been a moment, hasn't it? It sure has. You know, nothing's changed since the last time we talked, really. But uh, anyway, no, but uh, it's great to be back on. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. When we chatted last uh, on the show, it was about 10 years ago. It was before the AI craze. Everything was going to go into virtual reality, I think. The whole situation has really matured. So let's just talk about how you see the Electronic Frontier Foundation's mission having evolved in response to all these changes in our in our tech world and in our world itself. Yeah, I would say there's a couple of big things that we've really, you know, needed to put front and center. Um, I would say the 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 first one is 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 privacy and the need to have privacy first. We actually wrote a white paper about this um, recently about how many of the disparate problems that people are feeling online right now. Really, if you un unpack what's going on, it's the surveillance business model. It's the fact that we're being watched. Um, and information is being gathered, collected, monetized, leaked and breached, but also just in general used to target us. That really is a critical piece of a lot of the problems that people are experiencing in other areas. Um, journalism, for instance, um, is really suffering right now. And it's in part because the surveillance business model tracking of the tech giants has made it harder and harder to be a journalistic endeavor and push them into more and more uh, invasive strategies. Um, I think that's also the case for a lot of the misinformation, disinformation issues. I think it's also a lot of the cases about concerns that people have about children online and what's happening to children online. If we if we dealt with the privacy piece of this through comprehensive privacy laws and other kinds of things that can protect us online, um, I think we take a bite out of a whole host of problems. So that's one uh, that's one area. I would say the other area in the last 10 years that we've really done is we've really realized that the lack of competition online, the rise of the tech giants, you know, sometimes I, I call them Gotham, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, um, has really re-centralized the internet, um, which, you know, if, if, you know, historically, the idea of the internet was to have something that was so resilient that even if a piece of it went down, it would continue to operate. Well, I think we all realize now that if a piece of the internet goes down, we're, we're all in big trouble. And it, it, indeed, you know, this is the, you know, uh, the CrowdStrike situation, which is one company that provides um, security tools to all a huge, huge piece of the internet. Well, they had a problem with something they pushed out. And the internet, you know, people were stuck in airports for days, right? Like we re-centralized so many of the core functions of the internet that we're now kind of back in a place where um, free speech, privacy, all the civil liberties issues that EFF really centers on can't really be addressed in a real way unless we start talking about increasing competition and re-decentralizing the internet. So we we spun up a piece of EFF's work that is really focused on that. Um, it's led by my colleague, um, Mitch Stoltz, along with a lot of help from Cory Doctorow, who some some people might recognize as a, 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 a pretty prominent uh, thinker and science fiction writer, but he also works for us. Um, and has been working on um, these kinds of issues. So um, those are two things that really um, have kind of arisen in the last 10 years and kind of, I, I, I view them both as kind of things that are getting in the way of us having the kind of internet that really stands with all of us. And then I guess the third thing, I stick a third thing in there, is just the diversity of people who rely on the internet now. It's so, and this is more 20 years ago, but it's such a bigger, wider range of people. And they really, really do rely on the internet. It's very hard to apply for a job without the internet. It's very hard to apply for housing or a mortgage without the internet. It's very hard to just go through your daily life if you don't um, have the internet, which means the internet looks a lot different than it did. Um, and it needs to better serve the diversity of people who now rely on it. And um, it's been slow to do that. And in fact, in some ways has, has doubled down on some of the 
discriminatory practices that happened in the offline world are now happening in the online world, only they get kind of supercharged, right? So, you know, if you're looking for a job on a search engine and the search engine knows your race, you're, you're, you know, if you're, if you look like me and you're a woman, you're not going to get a job for a CEO. Um, You're going to get jobs that are, you know, more, more coded feminine and those kinds of problems, which existed a lot in the offline world kind of get supercharged by technology now. So that's another. And, and, and and also the deniability of these kinds of tilts is also built in. The algorithms are basically programmed to uh, protect the deniability shield of these types of behaviors. And, and, the thing that I think is is really important to understand is when we say the internet, what are we talking about? Yeah. Talking about computers. We're talking about devices. That's a, that's part of the internet. Yep. We're talking about networks. Mm-hmm. We're talking about telecommunications. Yep. You know, it used to be when I picked up a phone, so if I picked up this phone and I called through an, an old fashioned telephone uh, organization, I talked with somebody, my speech was protected. In order to listen in, you had to get a warrant yep. directly from law enforcement to listen in. Mm-hmm. But now, if we talk here, that listening in is automatic. Technology is not at a place to be able to listen into your conversation and uh, put ads in based upon something that you just verbally said to someone else. It doesn't mean that it's not a problem, but it's probably coming out of algorithmic decision making about who you are, conversations you're having over Facebook or somewhere else where not conversations, not the the phone. Is my phone listening to me? The answer is no. And that's not great news because it means that the simple way to deal with this is not the way that we get to deal with it. It's because people get categorized, they're in patterns, they look like other people, your friends, your colleagues, other people who are in your affinity group are getting ads for the same thing you are. And then you start seeing those ads as well. But is Alexa listening to me? If somebody else has Alexa on, and I'm having a conversation with them, and they're interacting with Alexa. Alexa doesn't pick up my my query to them. No, I don't think it works that way. Um, we haven't we haven't been able to demonstrate that, and I think there's good reason why. And the good reason why is they don't need that. They already target you really yes. well from the easy information. Doing voice parsing and analysis. I mean, even with AI systems, right? It's not very good right now. So. Um, so I'm not saying they wouldn't want to, but that's not, my texts have looked at this several times. And what about Gmail? Does... And it, the, but the bad news is that the, that doesn't have to be happening for your, to be tracked, targeted, analyzed, sliced and diced and served up information that feels darn creepy, right? Like it's, it's, it shouldn't. On the one hand, it's important to be correct about how the technology is working because it gives all the companies a, a, an ability to just be like, they don't know what they're talking about. These are people who are just making it up and they, excuse my language, but they don't know what they're talking about. You don't want to give them that argument. You want to be right about how these systems are working and not working so that you can really address the problem. And the problem is all the tracking that they're doing of everybody, not the individual phone call tracking, all the massive tracking that's happening in the background that is letting them get to a place where they can hyper target you and hyper target your children um, and other and, and vulnerable people with these messages. They don't have to listen to your phone to do that. And if we talk about it as if that's what they're doing, I think we give we give too much power to the companies to say that you know you're just you're just running around like the chicken and your head cut off. You don't know what's going on. So EFF is putting oh, no. their some what about uh, Gmail and 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 email platforms or messaging platforms through social media? Is is, is Google able to scan my Gmail? Um, oh yes, uh, Google absolutely. Okay, Google can do that. Yeah, yeah, they do that and they place ads. That's that's their business model. They're very open about that. Okay, so they so they can scan my emails, 
they can they might not be picking up my my voice through Alexa or, or if I ask if I ask Alexa something they are then picking it up right if I if I go directly to Alexa then Amazon is actually picking up my request right correct if you're directly asking them for something just like you're directly typing into a search engine then yeah you're ask it's it's definitely listening to you and and that's going to go into its ad structure um, but if, if if I use a text message just through text messaging, um, they're not listening because we're we're covered. But if we do it through a an app that is created by a third party, they then can listen. Is that correct? Well, it depends on whether it's encrypted or not. So let's say you use something like Signal, that's end to end encrypted. So okay. there's nobody in the middle who can read that thing. If you use WhatsApp. That is actually end-to-end -end encrypted. So Facebook, which owns WhatsApp, or Meta, which owns WhatsApp, knows who you're talking to because they route the message. They know how right. often you're talking to them. But they don't know the content of the communications unless you separately tell them. So if you, know, if you and I are having a WhatsApp chat and then you go online and search for something based upon what we're talking about, then that's going to go to them. Um, I mean... In some ways, this is making the case for comprehensive privacy laws, right? Like a mere right. mortal cannot figure, I've got a tech team of people who are constantly tracking all of this kind of stuff and we can barely keep up. So, you know, this is why we need to set a comprehensive privacy law. We need to get rid of the surveillance business model. This just, it, it's just something, it's, it, Moses didn't come down from the, you know, the mountain with thou shalt have everything tracked you do online in order to place ads. You know, that wasn't one of the commandments. So we can renegotiate that and say, actually, we don't like that business model. It's corrosive, it's creepy, it's privacy invasion, and it's fueling a bunch of other problems we're having in society. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I can continue to tell you what I know about these various things. I will tell you that it's, um, it's, it's way too complicated for people right now. And we need a policy that really can can stand with us and, and be understandable to us. So what is your, if you were to boil down your stance on privacy, where it should be, what would that, what would that be in a couple of sentences? Well, I think your technologies need to serve you, not the business models of the companies and that you should be in control of when you share your data and when you don't, you should understand when you share your data and when you don't. And it should be, the default should be that you don't, right? You set the default that that doesn't happen and you create exceptions to it. And we also got to worry about dark patterns and how those exceptions work and things like that. Um, but like if you, we need to reset things such that that's not, the default is in the other place. And then we navigate which kinds of exceptions we think are okay and which kinds are not. Um, uh, and and we set those. Um, EFF has, again, the Privacy First White Paper goes into this in a little more depth than we can now. We also have a bunch of blog posts about what our positions are. And then in order to be effective, a privacy law needs to be, it needs to have a private right of action, right? It needs to be something that you can enforce for yourself and not just hope that there's a you know, we have a good FTC right now. We didn't used to, or a good, you know, that that you have the power to enforce your own privacy recognitions, which in, in lawyer speak is called a private right of action. Um, that the law is the same across the country. We need to make sure that it's a race to the top, not a race to the bottom for the law so that there is no preemption. So there's efforts right now to come and bring in a federal privacy law that would be worse than what we have in California right now. We need to make sure that any federal law, which is not a bad idea to level the playing field, levels it up, not levels it down. And we call that no preemption. And then that the, the, the law itself is very strong. Um, and again, sets the boundary on no sharing, no, you know, no first party sharing, no third party sharing. So a lot of the times we're thinking about, we're worried about Alexa or we're worried about Google, but honestly, there is a huge marketplace of third party data brokers who are taking information from all sorts of different places that you may not be aware of, some of which are the tech giants, but many of which are not the tech giants, combining it, making profiles of you and selling it to all sorts of other places 
um, that are that's really problematic, really, really problematic for for our power as so all the fishing attempts that are that are coming hitting me, right? Are those people buying information off the open market to see whether I would be a good target, whether I have um, um, funds in my bank account that they could perhaps try and, and get, or whether I have assets, or whether I'm a certain age, or whether I might be infirm or, or in declining mental health? Are they basically buying that data and then are they targeting me for nefarious purposes? I mean, some people are. We've definitely seen a lot of scams, as you mentioned, that are aimed at seniors where they're they're making sure they're 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 taking the extra step to try to target seniors. Um, we've even seen some really they call them spear phishing attempts where, you know, it's it's they people are taking like something that sounds like the voice of their grandkid and calling and saying, you know, Grandpa, I'm in jail. Can you send me money? So we've got these kinds of very targeted things. But there's a lot of these kinds of scammers that are not taking the time to do the targeting. They just buy a database of people's emails and send it out because they send out a million. And if they get one or two hits, it's it's worth it. It's the same way that phone call scams work, right? I mean, scamming is scamming and the technology changes. Right. There's always scammers. And, um, you know, uh, so, but the, so, so, I mean, Sorry, the answer is it depends, but some of this stuff, again, we call it spear phishing, is is really very targeted and 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 has got some intelligence behind it, and a lot of it is just massive fire hosey sorts of things. Let's talk a little bit about privatization because um, one of the things that I'm that, that I'm really aware of is that in order for me to even access the internet, I'm going through a satellite network that is owned. Uh, by a particular uh, group and a particular, uh, and it's dominated by a particular person. Um, I go through um, cellular networks, which is owned by a particular corporation. Mm -hmm. I'm going through nodes that are controlled by particular individuals. Um, I'm going through, I get my packages delivered by uh, particular companies. Um, I, I uh, do my searches through other companies. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are about three to five um, big, big, big private entities that I interact with all the time, yep. every single day. Yep. And uh, talk a little bit about how you see that sort of consolidation, privatization, uh, control of the internet uh, being damaging to public interests. Yeah, I mean, it happened is the space for publicly owned and publicly controlled things has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. This is this is true online and offline, right? Like this is, you know, uh, one of the the you know, one of the points that my colleague Corey Doctorow makes is that like the 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 failure of antitrust law to stop mergers and acquisitions and other things from creating these giants and letting them run havoc. Like it coincided with the start of internet businesses, but it it, it affects us in all sorts of ways, right? We, airline industry, other kinds of, you know, I mean, the you know, the canonical thing you learn in antitrust law is about AT&T, right? The phone company, you know, and breaking it up and trying to create competition in telecommunications way predates the internet um, in terms of these things. So this, this tendency to not care very much about mergers and let these giant companies grow and exercise control isn't an online phenomenon, but it impacts what happens online. And so um, I think it's a I think it's a real problem. And 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 when we let these companies get so big and then we correspondingly shrink the public spaces, I think it gets harder and harder, right? It gets harder and harder to have a pure public interest part of the internet. Now it's still there. I mean, you know, I, I I often say this, like the internet is not Facebook, right? You know, we have Wikimedia, we have the internet archive, we have resources that we may not even see that we all depend on that are really important. It's just that um, it, it, it we need to strengthen them. We need to think about how to strengthen them rather than, you know, continuing to shrink them. And, you know, philanthropy is wonderful. Nonprofits are wonderful. We, we really appreciate them. But we also need some, I think, better ways to support, you know, spaces that aren't corporate. And uh, philanthropy can only do so much there. And it's great and it's important, but we probably need to think about, you know, public 
you know, public funding mechanisms to create a, a space that is just you know, not entirely controlled by a few corporate masters. Um, and I'm mm. supportive of that. Uh, there are people, Ethan Zuckerman, who's a friend of mine, who's a professor in Boston, has done a lot of thinking about this. Other people um, are thinking a lot about this. There's a lot of work. Honestly, Taiwan has done a lot of work on a, on the public internet um, through this uh, wonderful, wonderful woman named Audrey Tang, who is their minister for the internet over there. Um, I got to talk to Audrey recently on our podcast and, you know, we're, we don't, you know, we, again, I think there's plenty of space for corporate interests online, but it really has slanted in a way that I think is bad for us. I'll give you two examples, which, which I think are really interesting about the consequences uh, of, of privatization and, and consolidation. One is I just recently received a couple of different, um, uh, user agreements for large chunks of software that I just have to use. Right. I just, I just have to. And they basically said, you can either agree or you can't use our platforms. Yes. There's no, there's no choice. The platforms are so dominant that I, I don't have any choice, but to agree. doesn't matter what it says. I don't even bother. I don't even need to bother reading it. I have no, I have no choice because consolidation has gotten to the point where any other, it isn't that the other alternatives are, are less functional or worse, they're just not alternatives at all. Right. So that was one thing, you know, I, I it just struck me that I, that why am I even reading this stuff? I don't have a choice. Right. right? The other thing was, was interesting. It was a, there was a, uh, there was a uh, article in the New York times, I believe it was New York times um, in which they were talking about Indian cab drivers basically, um, who who are working for Uber now, and they they cannot make a living. They cannot pay their costs. And so they are requiring customers to pay more than the wages that, that uh, Uber requires them to charge. And there is an issue with Uber basically um, uh, uh, blacklisting those who rely on because now now so many of the cab the private cab uh, companies are out of business so that again it's it's somebody who is trying to to uh, make a living but that particular area is so dominated by a particular company uh, company now i'm not blaming any particular organization but it just seems like this power imbalance is is having real world consequences for us all Oh, I think that's right. You know, I keep bringing Corey up, but, you know, Corey has coined a term for this that, that was named the word of the year last year. It's called inshittification, right? Inshittification. Inshittification? Yeah, sorry for the language, but it basically means that these companies, you know, they, they're coming up and they get rid of all of their competitors. And then once they've gotten rid of all of their competitors or the other things that might limit what they do, then they start to get worse and worse and worse. And they don't just get worse for users. They get worse for people like your cab drivers and other people who are interacting with it. And um, this is the, you know, the, the argument around journalism and the way, you know, most um, uh, course, you know, periodicals and stuff rely on companies like Facebook um, to find people or your drivers who are stuck with Uber as a way to do it. And things just get worse and worse and worse for them. And that this, pattern is what happens when companies get too much power they start you know uh they start doing that and you end up with you know these situations of lawyers call that contract of adhesion right just a take it or leave it kind of contract and you don't have any say about what it says and you start to see really crazy things like recently um, somebody who uh, who went to Disneyland and had a very bad allergic reaction. You know, Disney's argument is that the fact that they signed up for Disney Plus and there was something in the contract signing up for their streaming service that limited their ability to file a lawsuit over here and force them into arbitration, right? You start to see this kind of contracts that are not really contracts. They're not a meeting of the minds like we learned in law school where you're negotiated. These one-sided, you know, kind of force you into it contracts become, you know, uh, the law. 
and the law that we all have to to work under. And you know, again, there's there's efforts to try to get at this. I'm you know, we're I'm very supportive of a lot of the work that they're doing to try to revitalize antitrust law. You know, Google was just held to be a monopolist in terms of search, and we're going to start to see in the next few months what the remedies are for that. And we really hope that they involve trying to foster competitors. It's not the case that nobody wants to run a search engine. Um, it's the case that there's, you know, a huge moat that's been built sometimes by venture capitalists or other people that, that you know, the, once you get so much power, it's really easy to squash your competitors kind of um, before they really get their feet under them. So let's talk a little bit about power and let's talk about power in the sense of uh, another the third topic that you brought up, diversity. And then we're going to bind this all together about what action we can take and what, what action we should take. Great. Power requires people to behave in a way that makes the powerful more powerful. And it, it, it tends toward people shaping or trying to shape those behaviors in their own interests. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of the point that you made about the internet tending to promote that and creating little areas of monoculture whether it's in our journalism, where you have the conservative monoculture and the the liberal monoculture, or um, through uh, race or gender or whatever, how do you see this current movement fostering a a series of little islands in which those monocultures uh, might thrive? And there's there, there's a lack of sort of uh, cross fertilization that is part of our uh, the glue that holds society together because it's it's pretty obvious that that we're kind of that there's a there's a, an attempt to create a lot of separation um within society and it's infecting a lot of a lot of areas yeah i mean i would say that i have a somewhat counterintuitive response to that which is i think that we need to create more little areas and more ability to pop between them than we have now. Because if you get locked into one of them and then you want to vote with your feet, like you lose all your friends. Let's say, you know, you've built up right. your network on Facebook. You want to leave Facebook because you're not happy with how that's going. How do you, how do you do that in a way that doesn't make you lose contact with those wonderful people you met when, you know, like when you were in high school? Um, and so, you know, our, my view would be that we need to lower the the barriers to leaving and increase the number of places where people can share information um, and let people hop between them and do them the way they want to, rather than trying to, I, I actually think that it's problematic to try to force a world in which you know, there's one voice that everybody has to listen to. I mean, you know, I grew up in a time where there was Walter Cronkite on TV, I don't romanticize that time period. The only things that got on TV were things that the white male executives at CBS News let Walter Cronkite say. The internet was supposed to blow a hole in that. And that's, God, I don't want to go back to that, right? We want to go forward to a situation in which people can move around a lot more clearly and have different communities and not be stuck in one because that's where their friends are. That's where they're- So is that-, is that require us to reduce the impediments toward cross-platform interactions? Yeah. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Is that- Yeah, it's called that, interoperabil is interoperability is kind of what the geeks call it. We've also called it adversarial interoperability or competitive compatibility. We're seeing some of this happen in the Mastodon network now. Um, Blue Sky is set up to be this way. Threads slowly is making its way towards being this way because I think even the tech giants, I mean, you know, be careful because Threads is a, you know, a Facebook uh, meta endeavor. You know, you don't want them to like go out and then circle and then close the wagons around this kind of thing. But interoperability between these kinds of things lets people hop around um, a lot more and empowers them as opposed to the one place that they've decided to get their news from being the you know, the only place that they can really be without easily moving from here to there. Because most of us are not just one thing. You know, most of us are, you know, we, 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 we may have a certain kind of politics, but we don't quite fit exactly into the doctrinaire crazy pieces of the well, that. that's, We want both that, we want that. That's part of your magic at, at EFF. So Electronic Frontier Foundation has 
relationships and very positive relationships, even in their even in your adversarial um, character with uh, people from these different companies, right? There, there are these dialogues that are uh, taking place. So I, I love this idea that we're not one thing, right? We're talking about issues, but very often in these companies, there are constituents who are talking about these same types of issues. Talk a little bit about your relationship with these various organizations, some of which you have policy disagreements with, Oh, yes. And how how do you work through this? How 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 does this actually function? I mean, there, it's an art, not a science. But I think that one the main thing that we try to be is right on the tech. One of the the easiest ways to get dismissed by the tech companies, most of whom are led by technologists, is to not understand how things work. And so. Right. The 15 or so staff technologists that we have on EFF are kind of our secret weapon because when I show up to talk to a company about things. Well, honestly, the first question I usually ask them is like, we're thinking this, is this what's actually going on? And then we let them tell us whether we're wrong and where we're wrong. So that when we aim our guns, this is why the, this is why I kind of reacted strongly on the, they're not listening to you point. Because when I aim my guns at a company, I want to be right on target. And I don't- well, you're right, right? So I was emphasized my language. I wasn't necessarily, uh, although it sounded like it, I wasn't necessarily talking, I was really talking about this whole idea of listening in and all these different platforms, but okay. but you're absolutely right. If you're not precise, you end up making yourself vulnerable to, um, to having your entire uh, argument, yep. your entire point be diminished. So what, what, one of the things that I tell the companies all the time is if you stand up with your users, we're going to stand up with you. And if you're acting contrary to your users, we're going to be first in line to criticize you. And these are companies, I've sued most of these companies. It's not just that we've been five policy debates. Like we have been on the other side of the V in a lawsuit against a lot of these companies, but we stand with them when they do the right. So we try to be consistent. We're values-based, principles-based. So, you know, we yelled a couple of years ago at Apple when they wanted to do client side scanning, they wanted to scan stuff on your phone to make sure you weren't doing anything wrong in the context of child sexual abuse, but also kids talking, you know, saying sexy things they wanted to report to their parents. There was a bunch of ways in which this was very going to be very damaging, especially to children who are already vulnerable. You know, the, the, the most children are most vulnerable to people who they know right? People in their family. That's that's where sexual abuse happens. That's where child abuse happens 90, 95% of the time. So a, a threat model that assumes that your parents are the people who should know really misunderstands how most kids get hurt. It's not like there isn't stranger danger, but it's tiny compared to the other. So we brought a bunch of kids and, and other people and, and child advocates to Apple. And we said, this is going to put kids in danger. You have to stop doing this. We flew a plane over their thing to make them, you know, try to get attention. Um, and we got them to drop the thing. However, a few years earlier, when Apple refused to dumb down its encryption to let the FBI into everybody's phones if they wanted to, they pushed back and they said, no, we're not going to do that. We stood on their side strongly, powerfully. So Apple knows, stand with your users. We're standing with you. Oppose your users. We're going to be first in line against you. And I can tell, I could give you similar stories about Amazon, about Google, about Microsoft, and lots of little companies that you've never heard of. We do a lot of work with security researchers who find flaws in the security that, that we rely on, big companies, small companies. Um, but we will show up and we will you know, explain to the company why attacking the, you know, the messenger is not the right way to be. And we will defend the messengers, but then we will also work with them to how do you develop, you know, systems where you welcome that kind of feedback. So, you know, some of it is we have a lot of interns and lawyers who come through EFF and then they end up in those companies. So we have good relationships with them, but a lot of times it's just having been in this you know, we were founded in 1990. We've been around a long time. People know about us when we show up. We have the credibility that we're here day in and day out doing this work um, and that we, st we've, you know, stand for principles. We're not always right. Sometimes we make mistakes, but over the long run, 
like we we have stood up for users in a way that people inside the company respect. And the other thing I will say is that almost always the case when we show up on the outside and we're banging on their door and saying you're doing the wrong thing, there are people inside the organization who agree with us. And so a lot of what we do is help give them the credibility and the power inside the company to say, see, we're right. You shouldn't do this. It's going to be a PR nightmare. This is going to be a dangerous thing to do. Um, we try to, to provide that kind of outer validation for what usually is going on inside the company too. So I have one final question, which is it relates to this AI um, uh, craze that is going on. And we're still in the development of, of how AI will function um, how it will work, how it will leverage knowledge that is um, that is scanned uh, due to lack of privacy, yep. um, and then incorporate into AI models. How do you see this new capability affecting the future development of your capabilities of, and and your responses to these issues, which do touch on privatization? It does. It touches on consolidation touches on privacy, touches on diversity of views and so on. But it's it seems like there's another whole category of stuff that AI is, is uh, going to create. And it looks like there are going to be new challenges for uh, EFF. Yeah, I think there are huge challenges. Well, first of all, I think AI, you know, machine learning systems and AI systems are amazing. They can do really good things and they, they are in a lot of areas. So I just want to say that because I think... Um, again, as people who understand how the technology works, I understand why there's a lot of excitement around these systems. I think that one of the things that is dangerous about them is trying to predict future human behavior in, in contexts where it's not appropriate. So trying to decide whether somebody gets parole based on your assumption about whether they're going to show up at their next hearing. This is really dangerous and it ends up being very discriminatory because the patterns that the AI will pick out are the patterns of the discriminatory systems that already exist. So, so you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you're building a system that's trying to predict future human behavior based upon systems that are discriminatory in either how they track or monitor or evaluate people, you're going to supercharge Harm. So that so that's one area where we really worry about this. The other thing is the kind of black box nature of a lot of these systems. It's hard to have due process and figure out how did this decision get made that I don't get a mortgage if the people who are running the system don't know how it's finding the patterns and legitimately like, you know, it, it, if an, you know some of these neural networks, like it, you just don't know what it's picking up on in order to figure out how it's making the decision. And if you don't know that, like one of our pillars of due process is being able to have an explanation of how a decision was made and we've, we've lost that. And so um, I think that's a really important thing to think about again. And, and most of the places where we're thinking about this are public uses, things like police uses or you know, benefits uses, those kinds of things are really, really dangerous because one of the pillars of how we make sure things are fair just isn't, doesn't exist and we can't recreate it very well. I mean, there's some efforts to try to, to do explainable AI, but they, they kind of are trying to backfill this problem, um, you know, uh, and so that's, that's a, those are things that we think about. I think the, um, and so there's, those are, those are real challenges that we're all going to face as we, as we think about how do we build a, a fair and, and safe system with AI. And then the other thing that you, you mentioned, which is, you know, there's a lot of companies who are sucking up a lot of data that's either publicly available or they're getting licensed for it. And then they're going to build walls around it. Like, I think that having public AI is really, really important. It's really important that the models and the systems that we rely on for the benefits of AI are not corporate controlled with big moats around them, such that we all have to, you know, kowtow to OpenAI or Microsoft or whoever it is that controls these systems. Um, and a lot of the legislation that we've seen, the early on legislation around AI safety is gonna have that effect. So it's really important that we recognize that open source, pu open AI, public AI systems are really an important counterbalance 
to this corporatization and we need to take steps to protect them. And I think some of that's being lost in some of the proposals that we're seeing around AI safety. When Sam Altman goes to Congress and says, please regulate us, be really careful because what they propose is they are the winners, right? Uh -huh. They and Google are the only winners or they and Google and whatever. And that that's a bad world. And that, that again, this inshitification process, right? That puts us all at the mercy of these guys. And we need to make sure, and most of them are guys, um, we need to make sure that we are creating these public spaces, even in an, in an AI um, machine learning type future. Um, and I don't want us to deny ourselves the effect. I think this is one of the pieces about being EFF. I love tools. I love technology. I love all these gadgets. I just want them to serve us rather than the other way around. You know, it does strike me, Cindy, that a lot of what you're talking about, although it's very specific to the tech world, we're talking about core values. We're talking about truth, yeah. transparency, yeah. collaboration, um, honoring the individual and not dominating that individual, not forcing. Um, so we're talking about very, very fundamental human societal questions. Now it happens to be about tech. Yeah. But really, we can demystify it all and we can say, you know, maybe what we learned on the in the kindergarten playground is part of what we need to consider as we're adults, right? How do we treat each other? Um, how truthful are we? How collaborative are we? How we respect other people? Maybe that's part of the reason why EFF has done so well over the last 30 years. I mean, you've you've constantly evolved, but you stick to your core principles. I think that's exactly right. And I think that one of the things that we try to do is not let the tech, you know, the kind of excitement that can happen around tech really divorce us from these old concepts that are important, these old principles, concepts, and try to help find the principle in the story, right? The, the shiny tech is really uh, fun and cool, but we need to locate those principles inside it. I, I think you're right that that is, you know, that's really center to our approach. Cindy Cohen, Executive Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, thank you so much for sharing your insights and for the work that you've done. Thank you so much for protecting us. And please thank everyone who is part of your organization for not making this a good versus evil fight, for finding ways to collaborate and bring people together. I, I think that cultural attribute that you have is as valuable as anything that you do. Oh, thank you so, so much. I will definitely pass it on to the, you know, 125 people who uh, who, who have dedicated their, their talents to this. And, and thank you so much for letting me come on and talk about our work.